Greetings, everybody. Um, deep bow of gratitude for your presence here in this moment. And um, so grateful for this chance to get to um, spend some time with you and to talk about this new book that's now um, two months and one day old into the world. And um, yeah, well, I'll turn it over here to Bob in a second because I think he has some introductory remarks. Um, but first, just to say how grateful I am to see each and one of you. And um, remind you, I think you were notified as you arrived that this event is being recorded so that we can um, share it some a bit later. And mm -hmm. I am um, coming to you from Madison, Wisconsin. And the little square that has a um, uh, empty red couch is my basement where my spouse Julia and my little one Reverie might be popping and bopping in and out of. Um, but we're all here together and um, grateful to have a chance to spend some time this evening with you. So I'll get into it some more in a bit, but I'll turn it over to you, Bob. Good to see you. Well, welcome everybody. And sorry I'm late, but we, we need to work on some technical difficulties of finding a Zoom link that's been sent out weeks ago. And I was chasing all over uh, email to find it, but I found you. Here you are. And uh, I'm grateful to join you. Um, my name is Bob Ullman, and one of the squares to me is off to my lower left, but I don't know where it is for you, is uh, John Helt. Uh, John, give a wave. And uh, John and I co-chair the creation care team of the Wisconsin Conference. And um, we. Uh, this has been an interesting journey uh, to find Daniel. Um, I personally facilitate a community of practice of clergy in the Wisconsin Conference. And um, we've been blessed to have as part of our community of practice, uh, Julia Berkey, who is in the vacated square in the basement of Daniel's house that you see over there, but you'll see her later. Um, and through Julia, I was introduced to Daniel. Uh, and hi, Julia and Reverie. Um, I was introduced to Daniel uh, early on. Julia was called as the settled pastor at Orchard Ridge United Church of Christ in Madison. Was that a year and a half uh, or so ago? Yeah. And um, <clears throat> of course, COVID kind of made things weird <laughs> for all these, these months, but we're finding each other and we're connecting with each other. And Julia told me about this book that her spouse Daniel was writing on Speak with the Earth and It Will Teach You. Um, for those of us that have been on the creation care team of the Wisconsin Conference, we were immediately attracted to the title because it was one of the scriptures uh, that we used for the focus of the conference annual meeting in 2020, uh, which ended up being a Zoom uh, conference meeting because the creation care team had a plan to have the focus of that meeting be on the Kairos call to action of the Climate Council, Cl Council for Climate Justice of the UCC, uh, calling us to a 10 year plan to uh, work toward remediation of the climate crisis, um, <clears throat> I guess is the best way to put it. And so we were just captivated with the notion <laughs> of Daniel's book and anticipate, anticipating it's uh, released this past December. So the creation care team has been in conversation with Daniel <clears throat> about how we can uh, benefit from his wisdom and his writing, which I have to say, I think is exceptional. I just, it, it's the most fun thing to read um, of his helping us connect with the wisdom we've learned from the earth. Those of you that have been part of the um, creation care efforts in Wisconsin know that we've done another uh, uh, author uh, webinar with um, <clears throat> Robin Wall Kimmerer. Um, and uh, this is sort of the sequel to that. Um, learning from Robin Wall Kimmerer that in order to uh, listen to the earth, we have to know the earth. Uh, and so we're delighted to have Daniel joining us. And I just wanna do a little bit of an intro um, <clears throat> that um, in the epilogue to Daniel's book, he has this quote from eco-theologian Sally McFade. There is only one world, a world that God loves. Since God loves it, we not only can, but should. In fact, loving the world, not God alone, or rather loving God through loving the world is the Christian way. 
so those of you who may be skeptical of why we're talking about four elements um, from Daniel's book in Loving the World it is a fundamental grounding in our um, biblical and Judeo-Christian tradition as we'll learn from Daniel tonight. So to focus us, I wanna share um, a brief uh, blessing that I came across from a good friend of mine from many years back, Talitha Arnold, who is the pastor of the United Church of Christ in Santa Fe. And um, I'm gonna pull this up. Bear with us Luddites who are still trying to figure out um, technology, but I think this may work. And can you see it? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so if you would all just mute yourselves, because I would like you to pray this with me. Um, and if, we, if we're unmuted, it sounds like Pentecost, I think, which isn't a bad thing, but uh, it might be better if we're muted and invite you to read this aloud as I invite us to pray for air. We thank you, God, for the gift of air, for cool breezes and brisk winds that refresh us, for blue skies and crystal clear nights, for the smells of every season, summer and winter, spring and fall. Most of all, we thank you for the air that gives us life. You offer your spirit to us with every breath we take. May we protect this gift that gives us life. A prayer for water. Thanks be for water that sustains the life of animals, fish, and plants, that cleans our bodies and blesses our souls, for the water of tears that wash away our grief, for the water of slides, lakes, pools, and oceans where we can play and have fun. Thanks be for water. Your water gives us new life. May we treasure that gift and share it with others. And I'll just do a little aside in Santa Fe, they don't know about ice fishing, but we should add that uh, from the gift of water in Wisconsin. <clears throat> a prayer for fire. Thank you for fire and the many ways we can use it to cook our food, to sterilize and purify, to smelt ore and form metal to warm our homes and to make the most of the electricity we have. You light our way and enlighten our minds. May we be open to the fire of your spirit. A prayer for earth. Thank you for the ground beneath our feet, your good earth that gives life to all. In a mystery we don't understand, green plants spring forth from your darkness. Canyons and mountains, plains and deserts, show us your infinite imagination. We thank you for this firm foundation on which to build our homes and our lives. May we always love this land as you love it. And may you fill in all the other reasons you have for being grateful for the land. So Daniel, thank you. Thank you for uh, your work, your book, and your willingness to be here with us. I'm going to invite all of you who are joining this, rather than take the time to go through introductions of everybody, uh, which I'm just thrilled how many people have uh, been interested in this. If you'd use the chat and just share with us who you are and where you are, I think we'd all, uh, really be interested in that. So use the chat to gather the community. And uh, Daniel, uh, we, we look forward to hearing from your wisdom. Uh, well, thank you so much, Bob, for those words and that prayer to center us and begin us here tonight. Um, so many of you I see popping up on the screen, I wish I could connect with individually, but there'll be other times and places for that. Um, but just first, um, so grateful for the gift of your attention and interest in this gathering and um, in my book as well. 
Um, so just a little overview of what I'm thinking for tonight. Uh, my hope is to kind of maybe share a little bit of the background of the book, why I felt compelled to write it, what I what I think might be interesting and important about it, um, and then how it might, you know, resonate with you individually or with your community, how it might be a resource for you. Um, and to do that, I'll I'll give I'll go a brief little tour through the book and maybe dip in and out and share a little bit of the writing with you. Um, and then rather than maybe breaking up into small groups or doing things like that, um, we'll just have some time at the end for some sort of back and forth um, question and answer and sort of uh, group wonderings about how we might um, how you might want to engage with this with this book this resource. So here's what the cover looks like. Um, it's a new book from Pilgrim Press, which is um, the press from the United Church of Christ, the UCC, based out of Cleveland, Ohio. Um, Speak with the earth and it will teach you a field guide to the Bible. So in some sense, the book is two months old. Another story I could tell would place it at about eight years old um, when I started at a church in Vermont. Another story would maybe, um, you know, bring it all the way back to the beginning of my life and my growing interest and passion for the earth and for um, connecting my sense of God with my awe of nature. Um, but I'll I'll just share the kind of eight-year-old story of the book briefly, if I could. Um, so I'm a UCC pastor. Most recently, I was the pastor of a church called the Weybridge Church um, outside of Middlebury, Vermont. And when I arrived there, I was pretty soon out of um, college and divinity school. I went to University of Chicago and really got a good training in reading, trying to interpret God through reading books, <laughs> through reading what other humans have written about books that other humans have written about and sort of that whole hermeneutical intellectual search um, for trying to, to understand the divine mystery. Um, when I got to that church in Vermont, I pretty quickly realized that my community was kind of attuned in a little bit of a different way. Um, I would stand up there every Sunday and I would say, you know, this is the second Sunday of Advent or this is the third Sunday of Lent. And then during the joys and celebrations, somebody would say, I just heard the, my first bluebird of the year. So this is the first Sunday of spring or I took a drive and the colors were just peak. I think this is peak, the season of peak fall. And so this community was so deeply attuned to the, um, what we might call the phenological calendar, the calendar of when things happen on the landscape um, throughout the seasons of the year and the course of the year, and that they were getting their sense of meaning and the sacred and inspiration and beauty um, very deeply from that calendar, um, a calendar that, um, I was somewhat familiar with, but knew that it, they were more familiar with. And if I wanted to connect, I needed to kind of do a deep dive and take my own kind of amateur naturalist um, training more seriously. And so I, I tried to do that over my time with them, um, realizing that if I were to make the Bible come alive, if I were to make theology come alive, spirituality, Christian spirituality, um, that it would need to resonate with the elements of creation with um, the earth and its cycle of happenings. So the origins were, um, the. At, at first I sensed the most popular thing people were tuned into were the birds, um, which I know during COVID has been a big fascination for many people, but this was the case in this community long before that. Um, and so I reached out to the um, local Audubon chapter and I said, hey, I wanna do a birds of the Bible summer series might somebody there who knows more about birds than I do um, want to be kind of a counterpoint. And I would preach a sermon about a bird story in the Bible. And then this person would give a more proper naturalist uh, perspective on that bird species or, or whatnot. And so um, had a wonderful experience that, with that. I want, um, an amazing Vermont naturalist named Craig Zondag joined, joined me on that initial birds journey. Um, and that sort of prompted me to think about the Bible in a new way, looking at it from um, not foregrounding the human characters and the human perspective, but trying to read the stories and foreground the elements of nature and see what impact do they have on that story. 
So from there, over the next four years, I each summer did a different um, journey with that church along those lines. It started with the trees of the Bible journey. That was uh, right around when that great book by German forester Peter Wolleben came out, The Hidden Life of Trees, and some other good books were being written about trees and just how incredibly uh, socially interconnected and aware and communicative and um, how much more just alive and trees were than we ever realized. Um, that whole notion of the wood wide web, this internet that the trees have where they can exchange so much information and communication. So we did a whole trees of the Bible journey and then we followed that up with um, kind of following other elements did um, rivers of the Bible, mountains of the Bible and trees or and uh, clouds of the Bible. So that was four summers worth of summer journeys with this little Waybridge church. Um, and with each one, we would have, um, you know, experiential components. We would, you know, hold Sunday worship outside by a river. We would worship in the forest among the trees. Um, we would have a, a sunset cloud viewing party. We would have a, a congregational quiz who could identify the most different cloud types, alto stratus, cirrus, et cetera. Um, so it was a really, a really fun thing for us to do during the summers. Um, and I got the sense that it, it was a really exciting way for many of my congregants to connect with the Bible and to connect their, their faith with their love of nature and with their concern for what's been happening to the climate and um, eco the ecosystems on this planet. And so um, I had these years worth of sermons. Um, and somebody else has already written a beautiful book about the birds of the Bible. Um, Debbie Blue is a pastor in Minnesota, has a great book called Consider the Birds, um, a provocative look at the birds of the Bible. So if, if you're a bird person, you should definitely check that book out. But the other series that I did um, in the UCC, the other the other series that I did uh, ended up being more elemental, less uh less fauna based, other creature based and more, more basic, more elemental. So I decided I could try to turn these, um, these notions uh, into a book project. And um, at the end of my time in Vermont, um, my spouse, Julia, we accepted a call here to Wisconsin, which is a important landscape for my soul. Um, my whole life, I've been coming up to a family cabin in the northern part of the state in Washburn County. Um, and so we moved kind of during the middle, early COVID pandemic times. And um, in addition to moving and having our little daughter, Reverie, um, I, I spent some time, um, I would say, you know, 99% reworking these sermons, turning, kind of scrapping them, but keeping the basic idea and then turning them into um, a book of essays. And so what we have with the book is the final project of that. Um, uh, it was, it was a, it was a fun project to write. I did a lot of the writing. My, my dad is a professor and he built a little gazebo in the woods outside of our cabin. Um, I did a lot of the writing in that gazebo, and a lot of it was huddled around space heaters and blankets. There's no um, no heat in that gazebo, um, but it was a real kind of joyful place to get to write a book like this. Um, so I guess I, I guess my goal today is just to share with you a little bit like what the book is and then how it might be useful to you, which I hope it will be. Um, and then to, you know, dream together about how we might want to use it. So again, the basic concept is um, there's a, a an old history, an old idea in the history of Christian theology that's called the two books theory of God. This is the theory that God God is the author of, or God gives expression to two different books. There's the book of Scripture on the one hand, and then there's the book of nature. Um, we find people as far back as the second century talking about this, this notion that we can re read for God in nature and in scripture. And in the prologue of the book, I trace the history of that idea. And um, my point with that is throughout history, there's been a, 
a growing kind of snowball effect of emphasizing the book of scripture and de-emphasizing the book of nature. And um, there are many different kind of arguments I make in that favor or reasons for that. Um, but my overall, the point I arrive at at the prologue is um, I'm going to make a pretty bold attempt to try to re totally reverse that trend into rather than privilege scripture, I'm going to privilege nature and read scripture through the lens of nature rather than leading, reading nature through the lens of scripture. And so the bold idea is to for, take the human characters away from the foreground and put them in the background and put the elements of nature, put the, in my case, the trees, um, the mountains, the rivers and the clouds, put those in the foreground, read, read the stories again from that perspective and see what kind of new light uh, we might see when we, when we shift things around like that. So the four sections of um, rivers, mountains, trees, and clouds, it roughly corresponds to the, in particularly in pre-Socratic Greek philosophy and in some other philosophical systems, there's a, a big discussion about the classical elements um, of water, earth, fire, air, um, the pre-Socratics like Heraclitus and some others um, had ongoing arguments about which one's the primary element, which one's the arc element. Heraclitus argued for fire, others argued for earth or water or air. Um, anyway, these are sort of maybe less from a scientific standpoint, but more from a humanistic standpoint, kind of the basic building blocks of God's creation. And so my book roughly traces those. It begins with water, um, which is an element that I think most naturally speaks to origins and source. Um, and with the water element, I turned to rivers and reread the Bible through um, the category of rivers of the Bible. Rivers being kind of water at its most kind of alive and animate form moving through the landscape. And river also being a way of naming what actually the whole water system on this planet is, the whole hydraulic system. There's really no such thing as a static pond that's self-secluded. It's it's really in the end all part of one big flowing um, system. Um, so with rivers of the Bible, uh, just to give you a little example of what's in the book, there's the very first essay um, tackles this theme of source and origin. And I look back at the book of Genesis um, in the in the creation account in the second chapter of Genesis, there's the river that flows through the Garden of Eden. Um, and then it branches out into four branches and provides water for the whole earth. Um, and there's been a long kind of fascinating human attempt to try to discern where that actual ri river started, where the actual Garden of Eden was. Um, the Bible has references that are both geographically true, like the Euphrates, uh, but then it references rivers that nobody really knows what, what, it, what that means. It's just a mystery to this day. So, and of course, that question of source is that ultimate question of mystery. We might talk about the Big Bang, but that's not really a source. That's like, you know, a couple milliseconds after the source. Um, so trying to get back to the beginning is, you know, one of the ultimate kind of mysteries of God and mysteries of life. And so reading that story of Genesis, I, um, I had a wonderful experience where I set out on foot. I was in Vermont and the largest river in Vermont is the, is called Otter Creek. I don't know why it's called the Creek. It's really a big river. Um, and it, the analog in Wisconsin would be the Wisconsin river. Probably it's the largest river in Vermont. Um, and it ran right by my church. It was the reason my church was where it was is because there were four waterfalls in the vicinity um, and that, that powered some early lumber and textile mills and industry like that. Anyway, so in this essay, I set out on foot to try to find the exact source of Otter Creek and I trace it on a map to its a tributary that goes up a, the side of a mountain. And I tell the story of hiking up the side of that mountain following the creek bed. Um, and it turns out I go, I'm so kind of focused on my hike that I walk past to the point where there's no more water left in the creek bed. And I have to sort of turn around and pay even more attention and try to find out where that water source began. That's just an example of part of what's in the book. Um, a lot of, so the essays in form are what we might call braided narrative. Um, 
And so in each essay, I have some, some scripture reflection, some philosophical or literary reflection. And then I, I often have some first person body in nature reflection. And um, that was a type of writing that was new to me coming from a more academic background. Um, but it felt really important to this project because my hope with this book is that it helps other people when they are experiencing themselves as a body in nature, when they are sitting by the riverside or walking through the forest, it helps provide some language, some, um, some way of thinking that can help, help other people articulate for themselves and understand for themselves what they already know to be most true about that experience. Um, so my first person language at its best, I would hope is the type of eye language that would connect with the eye um, in each each and every um, reader, but that's a tall, tall task to try to achieve. Um, so yeah, different river essays, um, a, an essay about baptism and how Jesus is baptism. I go into the history of the Jordan River and how that impacted Jesus's life um, and some other essays along those lines. The next section is corresponds to um, the fire element. I should say there's a little bit of an overarching structure to the book that goes water, fire, earth, and then air. Um, and it's not super explicit in my writing, but for me, that's kind of traces the arc of the human lifespan. Water in the beginning and then fire kind of adolescent years. And then um, earth element, hopefully some stable maturity, wisdom, and then the air element uh, moving towards um, the end of life. Um, with a phrase I've heard, death being one breath becomes air, um, that sort of thing. So the second section, I'm just trying to give you a little to quick tour here. Um, sex second section is the fire element. And for that, I connect it to mountains. And that's maybe a little bit of a leap for, for some people. Um, for me, mountains were an important feature of the landscape in Vermont when I was there. And there are more hills in Wisconsin than people would think. Some of them are even called mountains. Um, but for me, the fire element speaks to mountains because mountains are formed by these deep geological processes that are formed from the, the deep fire that's within the belly of the earth. So mountains are kind of formed by that churning lava um, and by the collision of the, the plates of this planet. Um, they also just simply have the shape of fire, kind of like flicker flickers on the landscape, the, the alpine ridges. Um, and they they speak to sort of the fire energy. Fire is both beautiful and dangerous, and mountains are just beautiful and dangerous, kind of that notion of the sublime beauty that can also terrify. Um, and then in the Bible, there are these really curious passages about mountains where it, it, some of the Psalms, for example, compare mountains to being like candles that melt like wax before God's presence. And that's sort of a deep geological understanding that something as seemingly fixed and rigid as a mountain is actually part of a, a always shifting, always changing landscape. So some mountains are rising, some mountains are, um, are being uh, shortened. Mountains are not are not fixed things. They're in constant flux and change, just like the fire is kind of a flux and change element. So just one example of the um, of a mountain essay. Um, in the mountain section, I do tackle some of the more uh, kind of challenging stories in the Bible. There's an essay called The Three Rules of Mountaineering. And those three rules, this is, comes from the mountain climbing community. Those three rules are, um, it's always farther than it looks, it's always higher than it looks, and it's always harder than it looks. Um, and so for that one, I, I, I go deep into three mountain stories in the Bible that where mountains are a place really of challenge and te um, testing. So we have that, um, you know, horrific story of Abraham being called to sacrifice his son Isaac on the top of Mount Moriah only to be halted at the last second. So I go into that story and the effect the mountain scene had on that. And then there's the story of Jesus being tested on top of the mountain. Um, 
the devil or Satan saying that he would give Jesus control over everything if only Jesus bowed down and worshiped him. So the mountain is that site of temptation. Um, and for that, I talk some about the history of the different attempts to climb Mount Everest. Um, in the, the local Nepalese indigenous tradition, the idea of climbing to the top of a mountain was unheard of. That would have been blasphemy. The mountain was goddess. Um, and when the, when the British explorers finally got to the top, the first famous phrase they said was, by George, we've knocked that bastard off or something like that. Um, just a checklist of accomplishment, um, just like getting to the North Pole or the South Pole. Um, so just these different attitudes of reverence towards the top of mountains and mountains maybe not being a, the place that we're, we're meant to kind of try to conquer or be a place that kind of teaches us some of our human limits. And then the third one being Elijah on the side of the mountain when he had to huddle into that clave or cave or cleft of the mountain and there was earthquake and fire and um, he was at a real moment of despair in his prophet's journey and the earth was trembling and he was on the mountain and then he heard a still small, a still small voice and God spoke to him saying um, a, a provocative question. What are you doing here, Elijah? What doest thou here? Um, and in that essay, I compare that with, um, there's a, Henry David Thoreau has a famous essay about trying to climb Mount Katahdin in Maine. Um, he, he would have been maybe the third or fourth person to make it to the top, but he never did make it to the top. And he just has a powerful reflection on kind of the sheer minerality of the world and how he felt kind of an existential shudder go through his being on the side of that mountain. So that's the mountain chapter. I go through some others, like there's another chapter on Jesus and his relationship with mountains. So many of his teachings um, happened out on the, on the mountainside and so many important events in Jesus's life, the transfiguration on the top of the mountain. Um, so that's the fire and mountain. And then we have the earth, the earth element. And for that, I connected it, like I said, to the trees and looked at trees in the Bible. And I was amazed to learn that more so than any other creature, except for humans um, and God, trees are mentioned in the Bible um, at a very amazing um amazing pace and amazing amount of tree references. Um, and including in the very first chapter of the Bible and the very last chapter of the Bible, Genesis, the tree of life um, and the tree of knowledge. And then at the very end in the book of Revelation, the tree of life is there again at the end. Um, so in the tree chapter, just to give you one taste of things, um, there's an essay that talks about this important moment when Abraham and Sarah are camping underneath. Um, I see that I'm way behind on the text here, but uh, well, I might have to come back to them after I'm done taking on my little journey. Um, so Abraham and Sarah, they three they they wander around a lot. Um, theirs is a wandering journey, but they had one spot that they camped. They came back to time and time again. And this was called the Oaks of Mamra, um, a group of oak trees in the desert. And when they were camping under those oaks, that's when there's the famous story about hospitality in the Bible, when the three visitors um, come their way and Abraham and Sarah drop everything and prepare them this lavish meal and um, only to realize that they were three angels or messengers of God. Um, it's a story that's important in the Quran as well. It's told three different times in the Quran. Um, and it's always talked about as the, the premier story of hospitality, that ethic of extending welcome, um, treating the other like a messenger of God. And so in that essay, I, I kind of wonder where did they learn this radical hospitality? And there's a traditional answer that it was kind of the law of the desert that extending hospitality was a matter of life and death because at any journey, any given journey, one can find oneself as the um, hungry, tired outsider. Um, and I, I say yes to that interpretation. And I go beyond, I want to go beyond that and say, but oh, this, this hospitality was so extravagant that it's been written down and has echoed down throughout the ages. So where did that sheer extravagance come from? Um, and with that, I go deep into oak trees and 
if you know anything about oak trees, you know that they are a keystone species. They host more other types of life than any other tree. Um, they host hundreds of um, types of caterpillars, for example, whereas a ginkgo tree common to plant in urban areas, there's only a couple types of caterpillars that can um, benefit from a ginkgo tree. And you can think of the oak mast and just all the abundance of wildlife that feeds off of um, oak trees. So I talk about the oak trees themselves as the real masters, the real teachers of hospitality and try to, um, you know, you know, celebrate their impact on um, Abraham and Sarah and their kind of contribution of this, this grand theme of the whole Bible, hospitality, um, extending welcome to strangers, um, one of the main themes of Jesus and the New Testament um, as well. And then um, uh, the last section, and then I'll get to some of these comments and we can open it up a bit, is um, the air element. And for that, I, I focused on clouds, which the air element is the invisible element. We, we sense it as the wind in the grass or the leaves, or um, we feel the effect of it, but we don't necessarily see it. Um, to me, the clouds bring our attention to the air element. They exist completely in that air element, and they give playful expression to the sky, to the air. Um, and again, so many wonderful cloud stories in the Bible. Um, again, there's the story of Jesus on the top of the mountain, the cloud comes and engulfs him. Moses on the top of uh, Mount Sinai, a cloud comes and engulfs him. And in that section, I try to um, say that our culture has a sort of cloud bias. We, we prefer clear, sunny skies, but the Bible comes from a different culture and different worldview. And in the Bible, clouds are really celebrated as God's a really close sign of God's presence. So the pillar of cl clouds that guided the Israelites as they wandered in the desert, um, a cloud was said to um, rest rest with them and show them the way um, and so on with the clouds. So I wanna be mindful of people's time here. I could, I could go on and I was even planning on reading some of the book, but you can find a copy for yourself if you are intrigued enough at this point to read more. Um, but I, I want to go back and look at some of these comments and then maybe we can open it up for some questions or Bob, I don't know if you want to jump in here and help guide us a bit. Well, actually, there's a prompt in the chat. Uh, can you read an excerpt of your book, a personal I one? And uh, I think that would be most welcome. Your pick. So I'm just, I'm going to read a bit from one of the clouds ones. It's the most seasonally appropriate. Um, I don't have a February essay in here. I have to say I've got a Christmas one and some a Christmas one and then some spring, summer, fall ones. But this is a, a, a March one, which is, we're getting close enough now. Um, so it's a cloud one. It's mid-March in Wisconsin. And we seem stuck in limbo, going back and forth between fall spring and third winter. The sun has been struggling to make itself known under a blanket of stratus for the last few days. Although today the blanket is beginning to come undone, the steely Great Lakes gray giving way to patches of murky whites. And ever so faint at first, like the first stars at night, patches of sky open the flat world to the blue beyond. And the sun finds a way to glow through a patch of thin clouds, casting soft shadows on the thawing snow. Stratocumulus like these today are low patches and clumps of clouds with an indistinct patterning. patterning. Known in English as twain clouds, they are a combination where they fall categorically somewhere in between the well-formed cumulus and the formless stratus. Just taking a quick peek out the window, 
I might find myself judging such a day as overcast, dull, dreary. When I sit with these clouds a little longer, however, I can't help but marvel at their subtle and unpredictable variation. That the clouds seem to have both form and formlessness makes them en enigmatic in a sophisticated and artful way. They strike me as masters of ambiguity and nuance, softening the edges between dualities like light and shadow. And appearing now here near the end of winter, the random smattering of lighter patches feels, if not optimistic, then hopeful. Indeed, stratocumulus often marks the beginning or the end of a weather front. And as this week's forecast bears out, today marks the first step into the next few days of a false spring thaw. My initial reaction to today's clouds, overcast, dull, dreary, is indicative of a widespread negative bias against clouds, at least in the English speaking world. When we're worried about the future, we say that we, it feels like there's a cloud on my horizon. Or when we're feeling down, we say we're under the weather and that there's a cloud hanging over me. Every cloud has a silver lining, we say, to cheer ourselves up when things are tough. Anyway, so that's kind of first person kind of just in, you know, looking at the sky and kind of seeing what it, what it feels like and what it, um, what it evokes for you, a sort of dull overcast day trying to, um, trying to speak to what the effect it has on you. I'm struck by your selection of that particular passage because if I had a nickel for everybody I've heard in the last couple of weeks who have been tired of the clouds uh, and the last few days here, at least two or three, of uh, people who are just so <laughs> grateful to see the sun before we plunge back into the clouds, uh, I, I just think it, it's a wonderful uh, reminder of. Um, kind of the ebb and flow that we experience. And when you were talking about the biblical uh, tradition uh, or the, the notion about clouds, as I was hearing you talk about that, I'm thinking about the desert and how much they must have welcomed clouds <laughs> to, to cover over that beating sun. And here we are in frigid Wisconsin, <laughs> wishing for the sun and no clouds, right? It's just, it's a crazy juxtaposition, it seems to me. Um, but the other thing I was thinking about and, and what I really have resonated with your book, um, it's kind of my own personal journey of mindfulness. Uh, you have helped, and, and I've kind of been on this journey, and you now have taken me the next step, of becoming aware of the beauty of whatever is. So that whether it's the sunshine that, yeah, that's great to see, but also the clouds that are great to see. And, and you just did that with that kind of transition between the cumulus and the stratus and the, the, the ephemeral kind of transitional point. So that's just what's occurring to me. And, and I guess I'm, we don't have a good way of figuring out what we're gonna do with this time together. So it's our time, I guess, all of you, I wanna say. And so I don't wanna hog the time and I know uh, Daniel doesn't wanna hog the time. Um, so let me just invite, if there are some of you that you know are being stimulated by this as I was, to just, if you, I'm a Luddite. If you wanna talk, raise your hand <laughs> um, like this, not with that thing on the, yeah. Uh, and, you know, we'll invite you into the conversation. Or unmute and just speak up. Yeah, I'd like yeah. to say what a delight it is to to view this passage through these elements, that it's such a fresh take on the scriptures that we've all been able to interpret in our own ways over and over. But to be guided through Daniel's brain and the way that he he writes, which is so eloquent and um, you can just get lost in one sentence over and over reading it different ways. So just a lot of appreciation and gratitude for showing us um, how we can interpret these these old and cherished things in new ways. Thank you. I was just going to share that um, 
I'm working with, I, I'm in, I'm in Colorado and I'm working with my congregation. Um, right now we're working our way through the Lord's prayer. And, uh, in that second line, um, who art in heaven, uh, kind of breaking it down and realizing that a different translation is who art heaven, um, instead of who art in heaven. And, uh, for, for us in our discussion, we talked about that, bringing it closer, that who art in heaven makes heaven seem like a thing that is further away, that is outside of us, but who art heaven sort of brings God's um, presence into the world in which we live. And we used it to really explore these divine encounters, which so often happen in the clouds, um, and that the clouds become that place, that that way of making visible, like you said, this transitional point, this liminal space between the knowable and the unknowable, uh, and the clouds become sort of this etheric, uh, otherworldly place where we encounter the fact that God is not, in fact, elsewhere, but God is here with us. Um, and so I really loved, after doing that work, receiving your book in the mail and seeing that reflection of that um, that way of in tuning into the clouds, uh, this divine encounter, um, but also in what you read today, how much by you tuning into it, you did have a, a form of divine encounter. Just, just the attention and intention allowed you to be with God in the world around you, like bringing who art heaven, right? Like you, you uh, had that divine encounter just by becoming present. So it was a really lovely reminder for me and one that I'm looking forward to taking to my congregation. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Tamara. Beautifully put. Daniel, I really have enjoyed your um, your style. Um, you write with a, an elegance. Um, I, yeah, University of Chicago, maybe. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, and I appreciated the way you have you weave in. It, it's it's not only about the two books of nature and scripture, but you bring in so much else uh with literature and philosophy and um uh, ground what you're doing with these elements in in lots of rich tradition um which is just um uh, really wonderful um I, I put in the chat something about uh luther's baptismal prayer that you refer to um could you maybe say a little bit about that assuming that presuming that not everyone has read that yet Um, thanks, John. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I have the time to get so deep into Luther's theology of baptism, but there I do reference a beautiful prayer that he has about baptism and um, a couple of really powerful quotes for me, at least, that Luther said about baptism. Um, Luther said that every every day that he washes his face, he tries to remember his baptism. And so that sense that all the all the that sense I began with that all waters are connected in the end um, means that uh, when we bless the baptism water as holy, that means all water is holy. And I think Luther was remembering that connection with the holiness when he was washing his face. And then he said, in the event of baptism, a Christian has enough to study and practice to last them over the course of their lifetime. So in that one little simple humble event. Um, there's enough to study and practice for a lifetime. And I think for, for that, he was really meaning the key concept for him, which was the concept of grace and that grace itself is enough to study and practice um, for an entire lifetime. But yeah, I've been thinking, I've been thinking more about baptism and it's, and, and the sacraments in general. Um, I have an essay in the book where I talk about a theology that's called the watershed discipleship, becoming a disciple of your own watershed where you live. And there's a provocative way of thinking about it, which is, you, you know, we have to be students, disciples of where we live, our local place, our local landscape. Um, and we have to be, you know, stewards and caretakers of it. So for the example of baptism, 
and thinking about our watershed, I've been thinking, you know, what are, what is the health of our local waters? Would we go out and baptize somebody full immersion style like Jesus in the Jordan River? Um, or would the would it be too pollu polluted? Would the E. coli levels be too high? And kind of the bold thing I've been thinking recently is if that's the case, if we wouldn't be willing to go baptize somebody in our local waters, then maybe we need to kind of put the whole baptism thing on hold for a while and go work on those waters and make them worthy of um, or restore them to their original worthiness of being waters of baptism. So this book um, is, is in spirit very closely aligned with the growing movement called the Wild Church Network, which is not just about doing indoor worship outside, but of really inviting the whole, the whole of creation to be um, conversation partners with us um, as we go about um, thinking about faith. So the baptism question, I think, is a fun one to really kind of, you know, bring outside and expand and and kind of re rewild, rewilding baptism um, is something I'm kind of excited about these days. As uh, Daniel and I were in conversation getting ready for tonight, I was sharing with him, uh, I was asked to preach the second Sunday of January, um, and it happened to be... Um, the communion Sunday because the first of January nobody was there to have communion uh, but it also happened to be the baptism of Jesus Sunday in the lectionary and having read Daniel's book I decided to call forth the four elements that are present in baptism and communion and it was just like whoa I've never thought about it in this way before so you know there's the water of baptism and there's the fire of the spirit and there's the fire that brought together the wheat and the grape, uh, and it all came together with the four elements right there in our two fundamental sacraments of baptism and communion. And I was thinking about that, Daniel, earlier today, thinking about tonight, and I went back, wow, think about that. We have two sacraments, and all four elements are right there in the four sacraments. Yeah, so just maybe we can end with a word about how you know, how this, I, how, how I would hope this might be of use, a, a resource for, for others, because one, I didn't write this book for myself, but I wanted to, it to get out there in the world and be of use to, to other people. Um, there are, not, not every essay, but many of the essays do include themes of um, creation, care, climate justice, um, other essays are maybe more aesthetic and about paying attention to the wonders that so everywhere abound. Um, I have been starting to hear from different churches that are using this as um, book studies. One really creative one is not calling it a book study, but um, a whole book journey is what they're calling it. And they're using the four sections to um, gather as a church out in different parts of their local landscape that speak to each of the four sections. Um, so rather than an indoor book study, this is a, a whole um, church book journey. So I think that's a beautiful way to engage with this. Um, for pastors, I hope it could provide some real fresh kind of takes on some familiar um, passages. And um, uh, yeah, I would think creation care teams um, could could enjoy taking a look at this. Um, and yeah, I'm eager to, you know, be a conversation partner and help this book, uh, find its, find its community, find its audience. My publishers at the Pilgrim Press, they talk about, they use a beautiful image of, you know, your book, you're like building a fire and who do you want to invite around your fire to gather with you and to be a part of that circle and a part of that conversation. And so, although we all are in little squares and I can't even see everybody, I want to offer us that image that really we're all in a big circle and um, you know, there's some, some fire, some light in the middle and we're, we're just gathered here tonight on this uh, February 2nd evening. Um, while a comet that last was here 50,000 years ago is somewhere out there streaking by the North star. Um, and we're surrounded by all the wonders of creation and today being um, in the Celtic tradition, the day of Imbolc, a day of, Kind of turning towards the spring season, midway between the uh, winter solstice and the spring equinox, 
a day when we begin to become more aware of the, the new life that's growing in the belly of the earth. Um, it's just, I'm so grateful to get to be with you on a moment like this and um, really your attention and uh, your interest in the book um, is the greatest gift. I think our attention both to creation and to each other is the greatest gift we can offer to each other. Um, so I just, a deep bow of gratitude for you and your time tonight. Um, I'm happy to, to field other questions, but I, at this time of night, maybe an, an hour is a good amount for Zoom and, yeah. um, but and yeah, happy, it, happy to stick around too. Brian, did I see a hand from you? Yeah, well, I just, if time is running out, I had to get my two cents in here. I think <laughs> this is an absolutely fantastic book. Um, I, you know, I have to confess, uh, Daniel and Julia and, and Reverie are neighbors of mine. We live three houses away from each other, which was just a, a stroke of good fortune. But when we met and you, I asked you what you were doing, you said, well, I'm working on a book. I was prepared to be, you know, politely affirming when it came out and say something, find something nice to say about it. I was blown away. You are a great writer. And, yes. and yes. this, I mean, there's such good theology and great research. And you, you're, I mean, you're a very artistic, soulful writer. So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I, I refer to it as a stunning book. I've shared with it in our, mor our shared, our, in our morning devotional group, several excerpts. It's really touched people. A number of them are with us tonight. So I'm really excited for you. I think this book is going to have a tremendous uh, readership and, and be highly and widely acclaimed. Um, so if you haven't read it, I really encourage you to do so. Um, it really blew me away on so many levels. So I just wanted to give you my strongest possible endorsement. And I'm very excited for you about this. Oh, thank, thanks so much, Brian. Yeah, it's amazing. To, we're, we're so grateful to be neighbors with you too. Um, and for your encouragement and beautiful words. Thank you. Um, and yeah, I'm seeing some of you that already have reached out to me about the book to maybe join you on a Zoom call with your book group and um, uh, eager and available for opportunities like that, or um, uh, the book does lend itself well to a retreat format or workshops or guest preaching. So this whole self-promotion thing is still awkward and new for me, but I'm here and available and I am eager to engage. So um, just know that. Well, yeah, Daniel, can that, I add to that? I, my my practice has become uh, this is the the essays are of short enough length that it's part of my morning meditation ritual, uh, and, and I'd commend that as another way of using the book. Uh, I read poetry, but I also now am reading a chapter a day, as they say on public radio. Uh, and, and and I I agree with Brian. Uh, I, it's just eloquent. I, I it's the most fun thing to read. It gets my day off to a good start. So even if we're not using it in a, a group setting, I really commend that to each of you for that. And and also I want to say to connect it to the creation care work that we're doing in Wisconsin. The reason we wanted to speak uh, to bring Daniel to a wider audience. We've really operated out of a, 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 a notion that says you can't care for what you don't love. And this book really helps me, us, see the world in a way that it, you can't not love it. <laughs> and, and for loving the world, you really want to take care of it. Um, Yesterday, Daniel was with a, another group of us, and one of the, the participants in that group connected it to um, the biblical, uh, Jesus's uh, biblical admonition to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And we just kind of opened up the notion of creation is our neighbor. We think of neighbor in terms of the Good Samaritan, but to think about all our relations, as uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer says, are our neighbors. So the trees, the clouds, uh, the water, uh, all of the all of what Daniel's helping us see with fresh eyes to look at as a neighbor that we love. And I I just want to add um, the book is definitely a light in the world right now and we need that kind of light that guiding light so thank you daniel for writing it and sharing so much of your heart and your 
your soul. Um, and I hope everybody here gets the book and just really enjoys it. I bought two more copies today to give away. Yeah. <laughs> That's another thing you can do with it. <laughs> well, again, Daniel kind of led us into, we don't need to belabor this, but uh, this has been recorded. Um, so we'll figure out if, if you, uh, I don't know the technology of how all that works, but if you'd like to get a recording of this, I guess you can contact the conference or some way we'll we'll figure out a way to get it to people. Let's put it that way. Um, and I'll I'll leave us with a little um, a little blessing, a deep piece of the earth blessing. Mm -hmm. mm. So deep piece of the running water to you, deep piece of the flowing air to you, deep piece of the quiet earth to you, deep piece of the shining stars to you, deep piece of this gentle night to you. Deep peace, friends. Mm -hmm.